This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. And welcome to worship here at Triune Mercy Center. We are delighted that you are here this morning. Whether you are joining us in person or online, we welcome you this morning. I want to draw your attention to the bulletin and to the announcements in the bulletin. Um, please silence your cell phones. Just a reminder to please do that during today's service. Also a reminder that during the last hymn, if you have a prayer request or would like to come and just pray by yourself or with a pastor, you're invited up during the last hymn to the altar railing if you would like to pray. Also, um, we had a wonderful time at the art auction on Thursday night. Those of you who got to attend, I want to publicly thank the Upstate Women's Club for sponsoring it. It was their eighth annual piece of art or piece of triune art auction to benefit our art room and i still don't know what the the amount of money raised was but i can tell you that a good time was had by all so thank you all for your support there also i want to thank songs of folk for being here at and lauren Kaysen. Um, they will be moving overseas i believe this summer and so wanted to come here one last time and lead us in worship. So thank you all for being here very much. Um, I would love it if we could stand, if you're able, and we're going to greet one another using the words on the front of our bulletin. You are God's child and you are welcome in this place. Let us greet one another. This morning's artwork is by our own Charles Anderson, and it is entitled, it's hard to see, you know, when it's a rainy overcast day like this, it's dark here at the front of the sanctuary, but it is Jesus, and he, he calls it Jesus in the mountains. And you'll see why I chose that when we get to this morning's Bible story. Let us now turn our hearts and our souls and our minds over to the worship of our living God. I would love to ask Russ Reed to come up and lead us in this morning's call to worship. Thank you. Good morning. The good news resounds. Christ has risen. He's alive. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have not concealed your steadfast love. Christ has risen. He lives. We will be singing hymn number 276 out of your beige hymnal. If you are able, please stand and join with me as we sing, I Know That My Redeemer Lives.
Last Sunday, as you all know, was Easter Sunday. The pews were filled full. And today is the Sunday after Easter Sunday. And the pews, well, they're sort of full. But today we're still celebrating Easter. Because Easter isn't just one day. It is a season in the church that lasts for 50 days leading up to Pentecost. So happy Easter. Happy Easter. There you go. Y'all are waking up now. There are seven post-resurrection stories in the Bible. And last week we talked about one of them, the road to Emmaus. And today, in today's gospel story, it is the only post-resurrection story in Matthew. You see, Matthew goes straight from the angels appearing to the women at the empty tomb on Easter morning to today's story known as the Great Commission. Notice, as you hear today's text, there is no physical description of the risen Lord. There is no portrayal of radiant glory or awesome power. The focus today is on the words of Jesus. In the final and shortest section in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus and the disciples meet once again in Galilee, where they started their ministry together three years earlier. They meet on a mountain, a place believed by Jews and others to be a place where revelation happens, where one encounters God on the mountain. This time, the risen Christ meets and commissions the disciples, equipping them to share the good news with others. You see, resurrection leads to commissioning. For Jesus' resurrection is not the end of his mission, but rather inaugurates a fuller realization of it. For Jesus' disciples, this means that as much as they maybe have failed Jesus during his passion, their call to follow him now is renewed and expanded. But before we turn to God's word for us this day, let us pray together. Spirit. Fall on us like the rain, Spirit, blow on us like the wind, Holy Spirit, shine on us like the sun, like the sun. Sanctify and heal us and make us one. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Listen to a word from God found in the Gospel of Matthew, the very end of the Gospel, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Listen to a word from God. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came near and spoke to them. I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've shared this with you all before, but whenever I used to hear the phrase good news, I would cringe. I would get stuck because it reminded me of the word evangelism and I did not like the E word. 
Growing up here in South Carolina, first in Greenville and then in a small town, Great Falls, I used to think that evangelism was about cramming religion down people's throats. Evangelism to me was manipulative with all capital letters. I remember being at Clemson University as a campus ministry intern and being handed out a tract at a ball game. The title, 10 Reasons You Are Going to Hell. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes me want to go up and go to church. I remember reading a billboard on 85 that stated, get right or get left. Jesus is the answer. I didn't want to be a part of any kind of that evangelism. And to top it all off, I grew up 30 minutes from Heritage USA. For those of you who can't remember, it was the home to the televangelists Jim and Tammy Faye Baker at PTL Ministries. And PTL stood for? Praise Praise the Lord. Well, I was afraid and embarrassed to be associated with those kinds of Christians. Still today, when I hear the word evangelism, I often feel as if it has been hijacked, not only by fear, but by believers offering simplistic versions of the gospel, false promises of prosperity and happiness, and the exploitive use of clever marketing and communication methods to bring home converts or win souls for Christ. Now, don't mishear me. I am not making fun of those for whom this is how they came to faith. What I am saying is that evangelizing should not be about religiously conquering or manipulating other people as much as it is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with the world. The good news of how God, through Christ, has been at work in our lives. As God would have it, my first graded sermon, you heard that right, graded, over 25 years ago was on this very text. It was an eye-opening time for me because after encountering Jesus' words, my cynicism had no choice but to slowly begin to retreat. I realized that in order to preach authentically, I really had to wrestle with reclaiming what evangelism meant to me, what it looked like. I soon adopted my church's definition of evangelism, and I remember it to this day, which is joyfully sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with the world. Now that I can live with. Evangelism also had to become something that I was no longer embarrassed by. Though I knew I would be associated with others who would tell me that because of my gender and my calling to preach that the Bible says otherwise. Yes, God's spirit was leading and I sometimes reluctantly chose to follow. Go. Make baptize, teach. Four powerful verbs are found in today's text. Yet only one of them is an imperative verb. Now, those of you who might not remember from English class, an imperative verb is a command. Can you guess which verb is the command? It is to make disciples. That is the one command out of these four verbs. And the other three verbs are still important. They support this central task of making disciples. Go, baptize, and teach. They are the how of making disciples. But what does it mean to actually make disciples? Let's go back to the text. Jesus commissions all 11 disciples. 11 because Judas had died. Notice that even the doubts of some of the disciples 
does not preclude them from being entrusted with this ongoing work of Jesus' mission. He doesn't say, oh, you, Peter, nah, you did me wrong. Take a seat. He commissions all 11 disciples, all of them. He commissions them to make disciples, not only in Galilee or Jerusalem, but in the whole entire world. you got to realize, I'm from a small town. When you go to a big city, that's a whole nother world. Amen? When you're in Jerusalem, it's not a very big place. And Galilee sure isn't a very big place. So the whole world could be the next town over. If we haven't discovered what the world is, the world can be very small. Amen? But Jesus calls them to go into the whole world. Jesus is telling them this. He's giving them a vocation, a calling as his disciples. He is also, for the first time in Matthew's gospel, passing along the teaching duties to them. You see, before today's ending story in Matthew, only Jesus taught. That's the only one who had taught in the Gospel of Matthew up until this point. But one can't come to know Christ as a disciple nor continue to grow in their faith without going and baptizing and teaching. The command is to make disciples, not just preach the gospel. Some of us are real good at preaching gospel and not making disciples. Do you hear the difference? This implies ongoing work and ministry among those with whom we share the gospel and with whom among it is preached. So maybe making disciples means to try and share and live what Jesus taught us. But maybe it also means to share our own faith with others. You might be asking, what good is my faith story going to do? Or, I don't know much about God, and I surely don't have all the answers. Friends, we don't need to know all of the answers, amen? We can tell our story of the difference our believing in Jesus Christ has made in our own lives. One scholar puts it this way, quote, the basic issue of evangelism is whether or not we believe that we have any good news to share with the world, end quote. He continues to say that he is not talking about imposing our beliefs on others. He is simply asking whether or not we believe that we have any good news to share with those who for whatever reason stand outside the faith we claim to embrace. When I lived in Seattle, Washington, I was in a whole new world. Being from the South, I was asked to repeat myself regularly in the coffee shop. I began to feel like a circus act until someone explained to me that even the media, the news anchors, had no accent. I was entertainment for the masses. I served a church where we worshipped in a movie theater. I often wore a cross necklace around my neck that was given to me by my grandmother. Truth be told, I forgot I had it on sometimes. You know, we get busy, we forget. Well, one day I was in the gym working out, and a guy approached me, pointed to my cross around my neck, and commented, Hey, is that that Jesus dude? Shocked, I wondered if this guy was hitting on me. I didn't know how to respond. Was this guy from this planet? Who doesn't know that the cross is about Jesus? Had he no clue who Jesus was? I was perplexed. Come to find out, he didn't. It was me who didn't know what to say. You see, assumptions can get us into trouble, amen? Evangelism involves two things. 
first, saying in word and in action the good news of God's grace demonstrated and promised in Jesus Christ. That's number one. Number two, it involves an invitation to respond to God's grace by confessing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and committing one life to him as well as being a member of a Christian community. Baptism is one way we enter into that covenant with God. There's a claim on our lives. What is that we say every Sunday? We are, you are God's child and you are welcome in this place. Some of us, by and large, are simply not accustomed, though, to talking out loud about our faith. Maybe we don't know enough. Maybe we don't even know what we believe. Not even in the church. We give that part to the preacher. For the disciples in today's story, faith and certainty are not synonymous. Even at the feet of their risen Lord, faithfulness is obedience to Jesus, even in the midst of doubt. Even though some are unsure, they still come to the mountain where Jesus directed them. They show up. The foundation or grounds upon which Jesus builds the Great Commission are found in verse 18. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. That is the lingering result of the cross and resurrection is Jesus' ultimate power and authority over everything. All things. Notice how many alls are used in the text today. You see, Jesus has authority over all the alls on earth and in heaven. It is precisely because of Jesus' authority that the disciples can be called on this mission, can be equipped for this mission. The confidence, the surety that Jesus reigns supreme over all the alls is all we need in order to follow the path Jesus lays out before us. But it's not that easy, is it? Before we go make, baptize, and teach, let me be real clear. Making converts is not the goal of this commission, per se. Making new disciples by teaching them to live according to Jesus' commands, such as those on the Sermon on the Mount, that forbid violence or retribution, and that are summed up in the command to love Neighbor as oneself is the goal. Share with others what Jesus taught you as you try to live by Jesus' commands. These commands are taught not only in words, but by deeds of Jesus' disciples who convey Jesus' commands by living them imperfectly. When I was a chaplain, in a psychiatric hospital and drug and alcohol detox facility, try saying that five times, outside of Atlanta, Georgia. I learned many things in that year, and I grew tremendously in my faith. I learned that the three most important words I had is I don't know. I'm serious. I led weekly spirituality groups with CEOs of large companies who were detoxing from their drugs of choice and refused to sit in group with full-blown paranoid schizophrenics because they thought they had nothing to learn from them. My supervisor confronted me one day with a haunting question that I have not forgotten in over 20 plus years. He asked, Jennifer, if you don't ask these folks about God, then who will? I will never forget that question and the huge impact it had on me because you see, I was afraid to bring God up because I didn't want to offend. Anybody else been that way? I didn't want to offend. I didn't know how to explain. Yes, you're paranoid schizophrenic, but God didn't do this on purpose. 
it got all mixed up, and so I just stopped talking about it. You know, our faith and our call to make disciples doesn't only come to chaplains. It comes to every follower of Jesus Christ. What has Jesus done for you? Where have you experienced him at work in your own lives? Who have you told about it? I must admit that this journey of joyfully sharing the good news of Jesus with the world still leaves me with a whole lot more questions than answers. Should I approach this person or share this particular story or comment on such a hard topic as a pastor who may view things differently from the person? But then I'm reminded over and over again that sharing the good news of Jesus Christ is never about me, nor is it about you. Though I sometimes still fret over it. Did I say the right thing? Should I have said something to or prayed with that person in that very moment? Friends, making disciples is always about God and whose heart God is opening to listen to God's word. In today's gospel story, we are reminded that we are to tell others of Jesus and his authority. We are to share what God has done in Jesus and what God will continue to do in Jesus. Whose religion is Christianity? It's not yours or mine. It belongs to Christ, who probably wouldn't even call it a religion. For Christ is Lord and has all authority over all things. The lordship of Jesus is not that of armies and force, but it is the authority of the crucified and risen one. Friends, we as imperfect disciples are sent to share this good news with all nations. You don't have to travel to Africa, though, or any other continent or country. You can make disciples right here. What I love most about this text, though, is the reminder that we don't have to have it all together. We don't have to have all the answers. We can even bring our doubts to the evangelism party. Who knows? Maybe our doubts will allow space for people to come to know Jesus more. We can show up as we are and trust that we help to make disciples because Jesus never leaves our side. We don't do this journey alone. Jesus promises to be with us always, even till the end of the age. Jesus wields authority, and because of that authority, we can make disciples wherever we may go. For Jesus will always be there to meet us. And if Jesus will meet us there, then our call to the world is a call to listen as much as it is to speak. The making of disciples, baptism, and teaching are not lectures or speeches to be memorized. They are relational acts that bring together all nations under God's grace. So let us share Christ's forgiveness let us share the hope and transforming power to a world that does not know him or follow him. I don't know about y'all, but that's good news to me. Won't you join me in making disciples? Amen. Friends, we have much to offer in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And the gifts that we share, they enable us to spread the good news in this place, in our community, 
and in the world. But based on that sermon, we're going to do a different song. <laughs> this is called The Hands and Feet of Jesus.
resurrection of our Lord Jesus, you have given immeasurable grace to us. May our offerings reflect the grace that we have received and symbolize lives committed to the service of our risen Christ. Amen. Okay, God, we need to talk. I thought it would be a good idea uh, to pray the scripture from today, but I was wrong. I was mistaken. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. I don't think so. I'd much rather stay. Thank you very much. Among people that I'm comfortable with. Baptizing them? Nope, that's the preacher's job. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I'm okay with the Trinity. Teaching them to obey all I have commanded you. I don't obey all that you have commanded. Who in the world is going to listen to me? So what shall I pray now that I have deconstructed your great commission? Therefore, stay and be disciples with people that you're comfortable with and sit there silently in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit? No, this cannot be the prayer of your people. Therefore, teach me not to strike through the parts that I don't like. Teach me not to ignore the parts that I'm uncomfortable with. Help me to make a stab at this thing called discipleship and maybe to invite some other people along for the journey. This, this I can do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, because surely you are with us, even now, and to the very end of the age. Amen. I would like to invite you to stand if you are able as we sing together out of the red hymnal. Hymn number 584, Lord, you give the Great Commission.
friends, if you call yourself an imperfect disciple of Jesus Christ, I want you to put your hand on your shoulder. And I want you to hear these words that Jesus commissioned his 11 imperfect disciples, then commissioning us. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do everything that I have commanded you. And I am with you always, even till the end of the age. You are commissioned to go out and to make disciples by going and baptizing and teaching. Won't you join me? And now may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the friendship and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. No fear is an excuse. World without end. Amen.